we are joined by Rod Lampard, who writes not only for The Spectator Australia, but also for Cauldron Pool, Eternity News and Dads for Kids. Rod, welcome to Spectator TV. Thanks for having me back. Rod, poor Elon Musk. Now, I don't mean that literally, obviously, mm. because he's a, he's a very wealthy man, but ideologically, he keeps being left holding the fort for freedom. Now, before we get into the whole scary Australian surveillance state, you wrote an article back in March about Elon's battle with Disney. Am I right in remembering that he was helping Mandalorian actress Gina Carano regarding her cancellation from yes. Disney because he wasn't, what was it, she wasn't working yeah, enough? Was, yeah. Yeah, so uh, work, Disney's work wars, I think I called it, was like looking into it. If you see their slide from, you know, when they fired her, um, you know, profits are just down slid fast. I mean, they, they're, they're not doing very well. And I think it, the, the more that they slide in with the um, the woke, well, Marxian woke agenda, I think it's best to call it Marxian woke agenda because it's more specific to the, to the agenda, you know, the ideology that they're following. Uh, so it's just cultural revolution stuff from now, now it's China and things like that. Um, yeah, so if you watch that, you see that you see that they're, they're more um, bending to those things. And Elon Musk has really just stepped up there, I think, in helping Gina do that. She wouldn't have been able to do it without him. She even said that. And even even though she's been given some form of platform, she's still fairly cancelled, really. Um, and she kind of shared a bit about it in an interview with, uh, I think it was Tucker Carlson, which she did, um, which she, she was very blunt, I think, about that. It was really rare, I think, for celebrities to do that. But she's still holding the line, even though it's cost her. And I think that... Really, the point of what I was trying to make with that is letting people know that you know I think we've missed the the, the real cost here to her, of her courage and how um, you know how strong she's been in holding that line because many people in her industry, you know John Cena and a bunch of others, you go back and look at their history of uh, when they've clashed with cancel culture, um, they've been very apologetic and grovelled back into the you know the the mainstream again and. Um, they've, they've gone through the struggle sessions and repented of their of their sins against woke and, and things like that. You know, I mean, it, 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 um, I think Gina is probably one of the, the the most bravest women out there in that in her arena, anyway. Someone should do a big Hollywood blockbuster, the sins against woke, to expose all this nightmare yeah. stuff. But I brought up the example because um, when a social media company embedded in the heart of Silicon Valley takes the fight against cancer culture to a studio giant like Disney, you know, that would be the headline of the century if there wasn't all this other crazy stuff going on. Do you think this is a helpful way to combat cancel, cancel culture, to have someone like Elon Musk using their money and influence to test this out in the court? I think it has to happen. Yeah, I mean, it depends on. I mean, look at J.K. Rowling. Rowling, I think it is. Um, great example. Of she's really challenging the, the the blasphemy laws that have been put in place in in the UK, yeah, Scotland. I think it is. I mean, that's that's an awesome example. She's. I guess she's stepping into the arena that Gina's in, and we need more leadership like that. Some some leadership with backbone and sort of hey, you know, hang on, this is a line in the sand. You can't go past that. Um, I know a lot of those those people would probably be very sympathetic to LGBTQism uh, for, for you know in its initial rise in the last ten years, but now they're starting to see the excess of that come forward through lawfare and legislation and lies being uh, put through in um, into law. Uh, we see that with Sal Grove. Uh, so so yeah, so I think it's so. <laughs> I can't remember the last time we said Sal tweets, right? Um, with uh, tickle and um, giggle, that's going on at the court in the courts right now in, in Sydney. I mean that, that that's sort of the the culmination of all of this uh, ideology in this movement and in that direction. And I think we need to have voices like J.K. Rowling, who Alex, who can stand up against them and call the the legislators on this. Say, okay, look, you've made this law, now come and get me, which is essentially what she did. J.K. Rowling was too much of a big target. I mean, can you imagine being the Scottish government, having one of the world's yeah. most successful authors in human history sitting in a jail cell because she said that women are biologically women? That would be very difficult to defend yeah. going forward. But this well, is not... This not, is not, not only that, but she's, she's a woman as well. I mean, you, you really get a high like the persecution there that's going on with these, the, the absence or the erasure of, of female only spaces. Yes. Uh, that's, that's putting that into the spotlight big time. It's not a good look for the whole feminist movement if that's where it ends up. Now, this is not the only court no, case that Elon Musk is pursuing in the name of freedom. Australia is once again leading the way in digital authoritarianism, despite promising that the new digital hate speech laws would be used to crack down on crime and protect children. One of their first orders of businesses was to protect the woke radical trans movement. 
Australia's eSafety Commissioner demanded that a post be removed which, you know, featured concern over an LGBTQ plus activist. This was done citing Section 88 of the Online Safety Act to 2021. Rod, is this kind of micromanaging of internet in line with the public expectation of what the eSafety Commissioner's role is meant to be? Uh, I think it's overreach. I don't think. The stuff with Chris Elston, who's, who we're talking about, he's the Canadian man who, who posted that. All he said was this woman, yes, she's female, is part of a panel of 20 experts hired by the WHO to draft their policy on caring for trans people. And what he was criticising was, he was actually linking to a Daily Mail article, um, and he was criticising how these activists are actually being considered to be experts, especially on health. And this particular gentleman in question, which is the Daily Mail, he was only just sourcing from the Daily Mail. So he was responding to an article. He wasn't actually making statements um, against this person, yet the E-Safety Commission has come out and said that his a post was harmful and uh, potentially dangerous and doesn't fit within the E-Safety guidelines. Um, the problem with that is the guy's Canadian. He lives in Canada. He doesn't live in Australia. So the, the big, a lot of the heat around this isn't just because uh, it's just about free speech. It's about government overreach. Australia, the Australian government is reaching as far as they can, as far as Canada to try and stop a citizen of another country from saying something, speaking freely, or saying something that he believes is is right and acting on his own convictions. I mean, the, the e, as I put it in the article, the East Safety Commission has its own rules about coercion, and they're there to stop coercion. And yet, somehow, the coercion that they're doing doesn't apply to them. It does that rule that they have doesn't apply to them. I mean, it's coercion control. This is how they define it: an abuser of technology stopping another person from using it as a weapon to gain control over them. I think that's pretty clear in what's happening here with Chris Elston and the e e e e safety commissioner. Um, well, if they it's definitely an overstep. If they learned it from anywhere, they learned it from the European Union, who've been trying to do this stuff for a long time. And I don't remember anybody remembers a few, mm. just about a year before the COVID nightmare began, <clears throat> there were all these big blackouts of Wikipedia and of other websites when they, when the European Commission tried to have authority over what was said online. Now, so we've got this Australian body trying to control what people in other countries are saying. You warned about this whole e-safety thing all the way midway through last year. Now, this is what the Act actually promised for those who weren't following at the time. It promised to protect children online from sex predators. It promised to stop online scams, to restrain provable foreign enemy psyops and disinformation, protect free and fair elections as well as freedom of speech, and to keep governments accountable. That was the purview. There was nothing in there about acting as a police arm of woke culture. Maybe it was in the fine print, I don't know, maybe we didn't read far enough down through the act rod. But the same thing has happened in the UK where very safety laws have been used to attack political speakers. Is this a, like, if we're going to accept this situation, Rod, what do we say to the e-safety commissioner about people in other countries who are saying terrible things about the Jewish people, about Christians who, you know, radical Islamic cultures who, there's thousands of posts online that would violate the e-safety commissioner's rights. Where are they on that? Why are they only policing very particular things? Because they have a double standard on terrorism. Basically, if you look at uh, Joe Biden, he, he, you know, his unity speech last year was pretty much, if you're not a Democrat, you're a domestic terrorist. And that all stems, that's actually coordinated. That was paraphrased. You didn't say that. I'm paraphrasing him and the sentiment of his of his speech, which was ironic given it was about, supposed to be about unity and building back better. And that all comes from what he uh, they put out early in, I think, 2021, called the four pillars on domestic terrorism. If you read that, and you go into the fine print of that, you actually see the domestic domesticization of the war on terror against the American people. And I think that you can see that happening um, in Australia slowly. I think during COVID that definitely happened, and I think they used some of that, especially in Melbourne, that anti-terror stuff was uh, deployed against pro-freedom protesters. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a, there's a... They're working outside of a framework that we would be consenting to um, normally, such as the protecting children online from sex predators, are very simple rules that, hey, you know, okay, if it has to exist, we have to have an e-safety um, department or, or a group or even legislation, it should just be five simple things that uh, which we just re which we've just stated, which is stopping online scams, mm -hmm. restraining provable foreign um, you know, interference in elections, things like that. 
uh, protecting free and fair elections, which is part of it, and freedom of speech as well as keeping governments accountable. I think if it operates outside of those parameters, it negates its existence, and we should be, uh, you know, holding them accountable to the laws that they hold us accountable to. The government is outside the law. The government has to operate within it. Otherwise, there is no rule of law and everyone can do what they want. And that's one of the problems I think we're seeing here with the war of hypocrisy is that they're creating a two-tier justice system where they can operate outside the law, like they're doing, trying to do, I guess, with Donald Trump and the persecution there. And even just recently, um, we, we looked at Elon Musk, we come back to him and he's backing Gina Carano and also backing Chris Elston, refusing to block his account, standing up to the Australian E-Safety e Commissioner. You have Brazil now on the brink of banning X because the um, Supreme Court, El Jefe, has basically said that, well, you know what, you, I want you to ban these accounts because they're, they're breaking certain laws. Uh, Musk has gone, no, they're not. You, you want me to ban popular accounts such as political opponents and um, media dissenters. Uh, I'm not going to do that. So what they've done is they've now pushed him into a criminal investigation into what they call digital militias, which is best termed as misinformation militias. So even in Brazil, you see this unfolding. Uh, and so it's not just uh, not just about Australia and e-safety. It's about what's happening in America with Donald Trump. It's all kind of linked together. If you look and read, the, look at the, the what's happening, you join the dots together, you can really see how this isn't just a, an, an isolated uh, event or a, an isolated um, movement behind the scenes in the bureaucracy. This is a appears to be at least a coordinated event or a coordinated move towards something far greater, which is total control over what we think and what we speak and what we um, what we believe in, I think, in that, that sense. So, well, yeah, overstep, overreach. Well, there's something alarming about Australia's e-safety commission being more authoritarian than Canada. I'm just going to slip that one in there for us all. Yeah. Well, but if we're, if we're going to go down the ideological path of, of censorship, you know, we can't have this situation, Rod, where we've got all these left-wing people saying that we want to live in this uh, globalist utopia. Like we're all global citizens. It's one world. There's no borders. There's no boundaries. We can't do that and then sit there and try and enforce Australia's views of acceptable speech upon the rest of the world because the speech across other countries is not the same. There is no consensus yeah. on what we can and cannot say. Does this entire fiasco violate the concept of globalisation that we're going, being preached to by the left? Because it's clearly showing that we, you know, we don't agree on things and this $800,000 fine being thrown at Musk, which he should never pay, yeah. is an example no. of just one of many, surely. I, th I think so. And like I said, I think there's a correlation between a lot of these different things. And, uh, and maybe because they all ascribe to this um, work totalitarianism. I do think it's absolutism. I think we're looking at um, a particular political group or political class wanting to dominate or even centralise power to the point where we are looking at, I would say, maybe quasi-communism, if not total communism, uh, which would be a form of globalism in that sense. Um, and I mean, China would be happy with that because if you go back to Lenin and all those guys, they believe that communism cannot be fully achieved until uh, until it's a global revolution. And so, you know, they they will they would be happy to see this happen. And if you look at commun uh, China or the, the the communists in particular, communist party there, they have links with Brazil even. And BRICS, for example, um, there's they have a lot of influence in, in, I think, that economy there because of the, how they signed up and why they signed up to that, uh, Brazil in particular. Um, then you've got the, um, you know, the the, the road and, uh, you know, the, the other ones that are, that are out there, I can't remember the name of that exactly, but they're, you know, putting up to the third world or, or majority world countries where they're trying to uh, are putting money into them and promising them things and um, Belt and Road Initiative, yeah. you know, that's what I meant. Well, I agree that if you're looking at the, the people who oppose free speech online are the communist regimes, the fascist regimes and the Marxist regimes, all the people who are saying free speech is bad. And then you've got Labor's e-safety commissioner lining up alongside people like Brazil. That's not a good sign. But I've only got about a minute here, yeah. Rod. I've just got a very quick question yeah. for you at the end here. Now, obviously, Labor are never going to give up on this whole censorship thing. They love it. And I know the Liberals have drafted policy like this in the past, but it's a new day, it's a new election. Is there any hope that you think the current Liberals might latch onto this and make freedom of speech a, uh, an election promise, or are we just going to be still fighting this going forward? All I can say is I hope so. I mean, uh, it really comes down to it, I've said it publicly, is that for people like me, uh, and I think if the Liberals don't step up, our only alternative is to vote Libertarian. 
Um, that really was what it comes down to. I mean, I'd like to see the Liberals st step up, but um, Julie, what the the East Safety Commissioner came in under the LNP, didn't they? Didn't she? And so either either there's been a weaponization of that since a change of government, um, or and she's been given like free reign, or the LNP had set this up and they just the Labor Party just playing with it. So then you go, well, okay, is the LNP and the Labor Party in the same boat there? as far as hate speech goes, which is poorly defined and arbitrary in, in most cases. And any, I think it, any, um, any laws that are built on feel-good policies as lunacy, mm. they, they're not always going to be good laws. And we end up with, uh, again, absolutism, government well, that are making bad laws, and, and, and they are. They're actually legislating lies, to quote Kiralee Smith, who, who's come up you know, like Sal has come up against that stuff in, in a big way. So, yeah, I would hope the LNP steps up. I'm not sure they will. We hope is the answer. And look, don't worry. If they don't step up, step up. we've got the, uh, the Libertarian Party, we've got One Nation, we've got the United Australia Party. Yep. There are freedom parties out there who will stand for freedom of speech and who will uphold your citizen rights. But I would thank you for coming on today. And if you want to read Rod, don't forget, you can catch him in The Spectator and also at Cauldron Pool. Thank you, Rod, for joining us here today.